Welcome to Expert Insights, a new Insider Insight series where we learn about a timely and relevant B2B topic from a subject matter expert. Today, I'm excited to have Jeffrey Eisenberg back to talk about cognitive bias. And if you haven't already, you can actually watch the first episode with Jeffrey that um, we'll link to in the description. Um, Jeffrey is the CEO of BuyerLegends.com, a company that teaches business people how to create customer-centered, data-driven customer experience design that is supported by narrative. He's also, along with his, his brother Brian, who is also interviewed, and we'll link that down below, um, the co-inventor of the concepts of conversion rate optimization, or CRO, and persuasion architecture. Their most recent book is Be Like Amazon, Even a Lemonade Stand Can Do It. So Jeffrey, welcome back. Um, for anyone who hasn't seen that first episode with you um, or isn't familiar with Buyer Legends, can you share a brief background so everyone can get to know you? Uh, I think you did a great job. Um, you know, we, we've spent the last 20 years, and by, me, by we, I don't mean a royal we, Brian and I, my brother, and part business partner, um, have spent the better part of 20 years wondering why people do the things they do, right? And, um, and, and also how to get them to do what they want to do, as opposed to what people sometimes think persuasion is, right? We... And so in order to do that, um, we've looked into um, what goes on in people's minds as they make decisions, um, you know, as they weigh things. So, um, you know, we, we've made a career in what originally was conversion rate optimization and now is really a, more of an optimization of the customer experience um, because conversion rates were too limiting. They didn't allow us to... Um, to look at product offers, what goes out, what goes on outside of our control. Totally, and actually, so in our last interview, um, I believe that that was when you said conversion conversion rate op optimization isn't actually a thing you can do. Like that's not real. You can't optimize conversions, but what you can do is all of this other stuff. So I mean, like, how how are you thinking about that today? So it's. So the conversion rate, uh, conversion rate is a ratio, right? So it's, and it's an output. It depends on something that you look at at the end. Um, what you're not controlling for are the inputs. And mm -hmm. so while you can change some variables, right? How do you know that those are the variables that really matter, right? So we want, we spend a lot more time thinking about what matters um, and uh, experimenting with what matters. And a lot of times, the, the conversion rate optimization methods that um, we made popular, right? I mean, my brother with uh, John Cordoba Tibidar wrote a book called Always Be Testing, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and it was a kind of a cool title, but not every test can be completely scientific in the business world, right? We're dealing with uh, limited sample sizes, um, you know, a whole bunch of other factors. And so, um, instead of being purely quantitative, we also have a huge um, bias towards the qualitative, right? We want to know what people think, um, you know, and there's a, there's a constant tension there between the quantitative and qualitative world, right? And we live somewhere in between. We're fans of both, but uh, know that they need a, a balance. <laughs> Definitely. Um, okay, great. I think that was a perfect segue into this topic today of cognitive bias because that is one of those X factors. Um, and it's completely relevant to this whole concept of sales and marketing and trying to optimize for conversions. But in this context, how would you define a cognitive bias? Well, it's interesting. I have a crib note, right? So I can actually give you um, what I've written in the past, right? And, and so I thought I don't have, I can be more concise. So a cognitive bias is a mistake in reasoning, evaluating, remembering, or other cognitive process, often occurring as a result of holding onto one's preferences and beliefs, regardless of contrary information. Psychologists study cognitive biases as they relate, relate to memory, reasoning, and decision-making. Um, now I'm going to make that more concise. 
we trick ourselves, right? We, we fool ourselves. We don't know that we do it, okay? And then when somebody points it out, we convince ourselves that they're wrong and we're right, that we're not fooling ourselves. Totally. I think one of, one of those areas of cognitive bias for a lot of people in B2B today, I mean, kind of across the board, it is that data um, issue. It is like, well, what is more important, the quantitative or the qualitative? I mean, like that by itself, um, I feel like has its it just its own sort of biases and everything. I mean, do you encounter that? So in the B2B world, okay, um, there's a, a, a slight preference or, or, or reasonable preference towards quantitative. Um, and, you know, there are people around who I think of as box checkers, right? And if you think about it, it's like a to-do list, right? They like to say, I've done it. And so um, they're very into processes, right? But there's no quality control within the process itself, right? So, that, yeah. so they'll say, yes, we wrote a headline. Yes, headline done, you know, so many characters, blah, blah, blah. This is what was defined for us. Um, but the quality may or may not be there. And, and I've seen people test headlines for open rates, but then not really think about why they were opened. Yeah, yeah. Right, so, um, and, and, and I'm, I'm giving a, a, a very partial example of there, and I wish I could go into more detail, and this would, I think it would give away the client um, if I went into more detail with that. Okay. Uh, but what, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that um, there are soft skills involved, lots of messaging skills involved, and that's usually where I see the weakness. We've worked with B2B teams, and they have a hard time getting out of their own heads, out of mm -hmm. those features. And even when you tell them, don't give me the features, give me the benefits, um, they still can't seem to get into how the other person would see that as benefit. And, totally. uh, mm. and also, I don't envy their jobs. I mean, you know, to some sense, we work for other businesses, but we do nothing outbound, right? Um, but it's really hard um, to get into people's heads these days mm -hmm. to figure out what they're interested in, since they're not really paying attention to you anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, this is this is interesting. There's almost two levels of cognitive bias as I'm thinking about this a little bit more and just this, how, how this concept of biases is impacting anyone who's working in a B2B space. Like we have our own biases, but then we're also solving for our target buyers and our customers' biases, right? So like there's these two different right. levels to be and, aware and of. The confirmation bias, right? When I say all, I always include me, right? Like I, I realize how easy we are to manipulate and how easily we manipulate ourselves. So um, we all have what's called a confirmation bias, right? We, we look for evidence that backs up what we already believe. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if I went ahead and gave you evidence for the things that I think, I may be ignoring other evidence. Okay. I think I'm not, but I could be. Um, the, the other one is the idea that people know what they know, right? Meaning, how do you know that what you know is correct? Uh, yeah, you, it's, it's yes. hard. It, it's hard to, to like, you know, I mean, that, that's like a big question. That's almost like an existential question. But um, kind of dialing it back down. When we, when we think about data, about evidence, Right, um, it, it, you know, we could do a, a kind of a Bayes, B A Y E S, problem solving, right? Where we mm -hmm. go ahead and we say, okay, what evidence would lead me to exclude this? Um, and and we, you know, yes, we could, and I can talk to you about it, and I cannot promise you that I always do it. Right. So, um, you know, and and then there's there's a, there's a worse one. I'm lucky the, the the one that's the best one is that. Um, if you're really smart, you're more likely to talk yourself into your bias than anybody else because your arguments are more convincing. So if you're in a group and you believe what you believe, okay, 
um, you will probably convince the group, even though you're wrong. Right? Smart people yeah. are very good at convincing themselves that they're smart. Hmm. Interesting. So, I mean, so what is, can, we, can you walk me through that process that in a perfect world, we would be going through these, you know, this process to either confirm or deny our assumptions? So, in, in, in a perfect world, we would not be constantly questioning every assumption we're making. Right. I mean, it just wouldn't be practical. Um, you know, Dan, Daniel Kahneman right, wrote in Thinking Fast and Slow, right, that there's really two processes, right? System one and system two. And the system one is the stuff that just, you know, you, you ask us, um, you, you know, what our name is and we know our name, right? We don't question whether there's another name, right? We may have um, things that people call us that are not our right? Well, like I could go on, right? But the system two stuff is you have to, the stuff that you think about that has more consequence, right? That's a slower thinking thing. And we treat too many system two decisions as system one decisions, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, so let's say that we have an email with an open rate of 40%, right? I've seen people say that, and then I ask myself, well, okay, so it's open, but is it read? And how, do you, how would you know, and what does that mean, mm -hmm. right? Is it read to be comprehended? Is it read to be figured out whether I'm going to simply dismiss it, whether I keep it for later? Um, at that point, we need to start thinking about what those possibilities are, right? Like, um, you, you know, how many emails have you opened, looked at, intended to read, and then they've never been. And, and all this kind of stuff. And so system two thinking is where it matters more, right? Where we, where we slow down and say, how, how do we know? So um, no, we shouldn't all go around questioning everything, but if we're, our livelihoods depend on it, right? For a lot of us, so, you know, in, in our business, our livelihoods depend on it. Um, the assumptions we make are sometimes silly, right? Yeah. I mean, like, um, you know, we're not really questioning what different customers think, why they would think differently, um, why they might be disappointed by something we're so excited by, right? Yes, um, yes. Right, what their expectation of it is, rather than how improved it is for us, mm -hmm. right? So, um, you know, and, and no, I'm not going to shame them. I saw an email this morning from... Um, a former client, really smart people, um, this is why I wasn't going to mention the name, um, technology company, um, and I know um, the head of marketing, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant guy, um, and yet they were bragging on something in their new, in their new revision, okay? that I know for a fact still is not as good as what, when I worked with them, we identified in a competitor, okay? Aww. Somebody on his team is so excited about fixing the problem they had, okay? Mm -hmm. that, that they're bragging about not being nearly as good as the competitor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so I mean, this is, this is really interesting. Um, and I was, I, I, and, and I will send him the email if you want. To. <laughs> but you won't shame him. Out. You won't shame him here. That's 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 good. <laughs> right, but 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 that's but what I'm saying is, is these are smart people, right? I probably mm -hmm. know everybody on the team. It's unlikely that that's a new person that I don't know wasn't familiar with the work. Um, but we get caught up in our own thoughts, in our own processes, right? What's it, it, because mm -hmm. I'm sure that this to them. I mean, it brings it almost even, right? It's pretty good. It was a major source of frustration um, that they had found in usability studies, right? Mm -hmm. So it's good, but don't mm -hmm. worry about something like that. It shows how far in your own head you are. Totally. Okay, I was going to go in a slightly different direction at this point, but I think this please, is... Please this, do. Yeah, but I actually want to follow this a little bit more because I think it's interesting and very relevant. I mean, this is where... 
things like cognitive bias do pose, I mean, like it's a, it's a risk. It's a big risk for companies who are going into something and thinking that they have all the answers or that they understand something that's going on, but really it's kind of a black box. And in, um, in waiting for your cat to bark, you and Brian, you talk about it as um, being inside the bottle or outside the bottle, which I thought was a great sort of metaphor for this whole concept. So can you talk about that? Talk about that a little bit. Um, because I mean, that's something that I think whether, e even if we try hard to be aware of that, there's still inside the bottle thinking that exists in every organization. Right. So, but there's a lot of reasons for it, right? Mm -hmm. The main one is, first of all, um, for almost any product or service that exists out there, um, the product that, you, that you're offering or the service that you're offering um, is a major consequence to you, right? It's your livelihood. Oh, you for spend, sure. Right? You probably spend 50 or 60 hours a week thinking about this thing. On the other hand, your client, even if they continuously use it, the more continuously use it, the less they probably think about it, but it's just not that important to them, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, you may be talking about like an event venue, Right? I'm going to make it something that, that, that's hard to challenge this way, okay? And the thing is that if you run the venue, right, you're consistently concerned with everything about it, the comp who the competitors are and everything else. But when you're the person who's buying it, you're only concerned at the time you need to make the choice, right? And then you're only evaluating it by what you need to do there at that time, that's it, right? Yeah. And so yours, and, it, right, I'm, I, and I wanted to make it something that that is kind of all consuming, right, when you're having an event, but yet it's a very, very limited scope of time that we're worried about this place, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So the kind of questions that we have are very different, right? And so in, in the book, we talk about the Johari window, which is one of our favorite ways of, of understanding um, the world, which is um, kind of like, what's, what can you see about me, right? Like, maybe I have a big stain on my shirt and I haven't realized it yet. If I don't have a big stain on my shirt, I'm likely to get one. But, right, but, but right now, um, right, I, I don't see it. Um, so it's hidden for me, right? Um, there are areas, where, and, and there are areas that, I couldn't see, like I could go to a mirror and find that out, right? There are areas that I'm deliberate, that I'm not necessarily deliberately concealing, but are hidden from you, right? Just because of where I am, you don't know what shade of blue my blue jeans are, right? Are they dark, are they light, okay? Um, and it's not a secret, okay, that they're, they're dark, by the way, because um, I knew you were worried. Um, but it's not a secret, but it's hidden from you because I'm sitting, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So, and then there are things that are unknown to both of us. You, you, you know, like neither one of us knows what's going to happen um, three days from now or what the lottery numbers are, right? If you, if you know what the lottery numbers are and you're not telling me, I'm going to be very upset. Um, but what we're looking for is to widen the area that's known to everybody. Right. This is this is what we call uncovery. It's always like people talk about discovery, and mm -hmm. you know, discovery to us has a negative connotation. At best, it sounds like Columbus, and even that doesn't sound so good. Yeah, yeah. So her, <laughs> true. Right. True. So what we're talking about is uncovering. Right. It's it has to do with the curse of knowledge. Right. What do you know that your customers don't? Mm -hmm. um, what do your customers know? about how they're seeing you that you can't see, right? And the wider we open that open area, right? The area that's not hidden, the more likely we are to get people to buy what's appropriate for them, mm. right? Mm -hmm. if, if ever, I mean, I ask people all the time, if everybody knew what you could really do for their business, would you have too much, too much bus more business that you can handle? And if the answer isn't yes, the problem is in your business, right? It's not a marketing problem. 
it's your business itself, right? You're not communicating that well enough. That's a okay. great uh, question. Mm -hmm. Well, it's kind of interesting. People ask us that all the time because they can't figure out what we do with clients. Like, it's mm. a real, it's a real issue, right? And so when we, um, when we explain it, right? Sometimes people get it, or sometimes people. Um, understand it without feeling the need, mm. right? Yeah. Um, and that's okay, mm -hmm. right? I mean, like, that's, that's what it is, but it clearly is a self-disclosure problem. Many of them would feel more urgency, right, if they understood it. Right, uh, yeah, so I mean... It, right, so understanding, the, even understanding that problem lets you know, right? There's, most of the time, it's indirect. So if you're a marketing person, okay, you will be contacted by people who think they need help with their marketing. And about, well, I don't know, in my experience, more than 75% of the time, three out of four, actually don't have a marketing problem. Mm -hmm. They have a problem or they have a personnel problem or um, you know, they have a technology problem. I mean, I've seen all sorts of reasons why they, well, they have a finance problem, right? I've seen all sorts of reasons that people blame on not having enough leads or not having, right? And actually, that's not the problem. 100% agree. And I mean, I, I see that also. But it's easy to blame it on that, right? Because I think marketing is kind of a little more nebulous or that's what you think you feel like there's this tendency to think to oversimplify and in this case maybe think top of funnel or just yeah not consider other factors at play um but i mean so when you have someone it's something like um like top of funnel right um can i name the company i'll tell you what we're working with a law firm okay, okay who um pretty big deal right but by, by nature law firms are are local mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. but in their area they had this overwhelming amount of leads and they were not growing okay like like we literally had their phone ringing off the hook we were working together with um one of our partners who does their advertising um and um we finally said okay look you keep talking about the quality of the leads. Give us um, a day to train a part of the call center and let them do what we say to do. Okay? And let's see how it is. Mm -hmm. Right? And a totally untrained call center. Basically, it was to people down there, tell them what it was, because mm -hmm. their point was to get an appointment. That's really all it was. And so, we explained to the call center, right, we made a very simple um, leap that we understand that the customer is that when people are calling you for DUI, you are the expert. This is your lead to lose. Don't let anybody else, like these people are hoping, they're wishing that you'll say, okay, no worries. We can help you take care of that. Let's book an appointment for you, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas some of their salespeople were, were, they were almost like inviting them to ask questions about the firm. And, and it wasn't, right? Like, it, like we've convinced you in the advertising. Now, they actually, um, and, and, and by the way, they were very profitable at first, but they have a problem that we caused a different problem, which is that that's not infinitely scalable. Yes. Right? yes. But, but that's great. We showed them where the problem was and they were willing to listen, right? But I see this all the time in terms of um, how people answer telephone calls. I mean, we, we've got, we have it with both retailers and business to business, right? Mm -hmm. Where, and, and MIT has done a study on this, right? There's a, there's a Kellogg MIT study um, by Sales Insider. Okay, where they talk about lead times and how, how, how long before you call. Okay? okay, and the idea that if you call after an hour, it's almost the same as a cold call, but if mm. you want to, what, 
uh, uh, like five minutes is about people's time for returning a call. Well, we've seen this over and over, but many companies, right, will blame the people who generated the leads, right, as opposed to the fact that they got back to the leads when the leads were already distracted or uninterested right. by somebody. Now, this is not a point, this is not a finger pointing exercise because in, in our way of thinking, it doesn't actually matter, right? Like there may be a factual, okay, this is the company. But if marketing is getting blamed, right, what it actually shows is that the decision-making process of the company doesn't understand the totality of how a, a prospective customer becomes a customer, right? This yeah. is not, right, like, like they don't have the right expectations, they don't have the right balance, they don't know how to organize their company to meet their clients' needs. Mm -hmm. 100%. Right? Okay. As opposed to it's this guy's fault or that. It's not about faults, right? And we're not looking for faults. We're looking for a rebalancing of priorities. Mm -hmm. And so you actually have a model for talking about this, which I think is really helpful. And you call it persuasion architecture. And I think what's happening here in this example, you know, when you, you have the phone ringing off the hook, you have an untrained call center, what happens between someone seeing an advertisement and picking up the phone and calling and connecting with someone who can't really meet their needs, that's a breakdown in persuasive momentum, correct? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so uh, t talk uh, about so that. By, by, persuasion architecture is the original term that we use, but we've, not just because it's the name of the company, but, but at the same time, we decided to use buyer legends as yes. opposed to persuasion architecture. Yes. And, and it, it's simply because it's, it uses a lot of the same principles, but it's actually way easier to talk about. And so persuasive momentum, okay, is that feeling that happens. I'm, I'm, I'm going to describe it two ways. One from the customer, is that feeling that it happens, that, 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 that just occurs where you just feel um, drawn in, right? where it just becomes easier and easier and you're, you, you know, you're feeling more and more comfortable and, you know, and you drive out with the car and you never had a bad feeling about it. Bought a car. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay? Um, in a buying, um, in a persuasive system, right? Many, every buying scenario occurs in a persuasive system, whether it's a system you've designed or it's a system that is that you know that is de facto the system. There's a system. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, within that system, there are only two things you can do: is you can stoke up motivation, much harder to do than people think it is. Okay. Right. Not impossible, but but kind of hard, especially in business to business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, you, 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 it might be easier if you're talking about a vacation, okay, right? Like you sure, can, you sure. Know, right? Um, or you can move fr remove friction, right? And a lot of the friction comes from trying to find answers to questions that may sound obvious to you, right? Mm -hmm. When I ask about your competitor, I'm not necessarily saying they're better or convince me. I, it's maybe because I don't understand it. I don't understand a framework in which to evaluate them. Um, you know, I am looking for help. If I, if I knew what I wanted to buy, I'd already buy it, right? Right. So mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of different ways you can create friction, right? And a lot of different ways that you can demotivate somebody. By the way, that's much easier than motivating somebody, right? To demotivate. And again, especially in B2B. I yes. Think. Because yeah. if you think about it, friction creates demotivation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. So there's a, there's a, it, within that system, we can remove the friction and then we need to expose the things that might motivate, right? They're not going to be exciting things. Okay. But they're going to be the things that you probably know about and haven't communicated well. Why? Because you don't know, they don't know them. Right. Okay, right. and so this is this. I mean, we're working with a big company right now that works with um, professionals, 
okay, that um, that buy these products all the time, right? It's not procurement, but it's a it's a product. Um, and while we're going while we're going through our recovery with them, one of the things we found out is that they have a, a one very distinct feature, okay, okay, that nobody else has, right? And it's 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 meant to be able to recycle it at the end and it's a security issue, right? Now, that sounds great. And it was a, a, an answer to a problem that only a few people felt. Mm. But it's kind of interesting that even their salespeople barely talk about it because it's not always a felt need. Okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. However, um, it meets certain corporate requirements, especially for big companies, right? And it's a thing that can work in their favor later on. Okay. 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 Because you're not usually the person asking the original question, right? But to the person who's going to sign off at the end, this is the big plus. This is, mm. this is like, oh, 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 you know, mm -hmm. it's more than a cherry on top. It's more like the whipped cream. Okay. Got it. Uh, okay. Right. And it was kind of surprising, right? Because it wasn't that we weren't aware of the influencers and who just, what we didn't, what, what nobody realized was that you could get to a really late stage and not have this clever little feature exposed to the people who would actually care, right? To the people who could actually say, oh, we were environmentally oh. responsible. Okay, so so this blind spot, it was they had the feature, they knew at a high level that it was important, but their sales staff wasn't necessarily trained about when to bring it up or sales staff was trained, they know about it. And they But they don't know when to introduce it. Right. They the if they mention it to the people who engage with them, it's not important. Like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what happens is they got trained, they probably said it a few times and realize that that person didn't care. Yeah. Like they didn't realize that at the end of the deal that it would be important. So they didn't know that they had to keep repeating it until a person that they don't know and probably never will meet will have to sign off on this deal. Yeah, yeah. Okay? Yeah. Um, and so we've, we've tried, we're, we're trying to reorganize part of that selling process so that we insert that because we can't tell people who don't care about a feature they don't care about. Okay. Yeah, a hundred percent. But we can't allow this thing to pass, right? So, again, right? It's a. It's not that we are trying to ram this this information down their throat. Mm -hmm. Okay, but you have to find the right balance in the right place. Totally. Okay, I think this is a great example because I mean I I see this a lot also when you started telling the story. It's. I, I can think of a very similar example with with a right. Company. They're hard to tell abstractly to protect your clients. Right, uh, right. I, I ask forgiveness to everybody who listens, but I, I hope that I'm making my point. I, I it, it makes sense to me listening to it, but I mean we deal with these kinds of things a, a lot. Um, but I think it is relatable. Just this whole idea of you know feeling like you have a marketing issue. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But there's almost always something else going on in in the background and you know if you're losing deals at the 11th hour you know or late into that sales cycle especially in b2b then that's something to look at and it could it could be any number of things it could be you know a feature it could be um just like a compliance requirement it could be the way your sales staff is trained i mean it could be a whole number of issues but um so here i think models are really helpful to kind of frameworks to to be able to understand this process and understand like okay coming back around to the the subject of cognitive bias like how are we knowing that we have blind spots and knowing that this is a problem how do we address that and so you talked about pers persuasion architecture but now maybe talk about fire legends because okay. This is, a, this is something I think a, a lot of people listening might be at least somewhat familiar with the concept of persuasion architecture, but this, Fire Legends well, is something unique. So, so 
Um, everybody's, or most people are familiar with the idea of buyer personas. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the word buyer persona is really something that um, Adele Rabella popularized. Okay. Um, she's a friend, um, very smart person. Um, and what she did was um, decide that people needed to know more about the people who buy. So, so she created these, the, the, so she created these personas. Um, mind you, we were using it before her, okay? But we never wanted to create a buyer persona. It's a little bit different way of thinking about what we were doing. Um, and, and so um, we've been doing this since like 2001, okay? What we were doing is using that Johari window, which is actually a therapy technique, okay, based on... Really? Self. Yeah, yeah, it comes out of therapy. My, my, my brother, when I um, got him to start working with me, when I took him, I took him out of school, he was studying for his master's in social work, right? He showed me this thing, and it was like, oh my God, that's amazing, right? Like, this explains so much. And what it is, 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 is a way of figuring out how to get that information out there, right? Therapists basically, uh, you know, box things into those categories and say, okay, I'm going to try and get this part of the information out. And so the best way to do it that we know of, right, is to use personas, but not in the way that Adele teaches or lots of people are using them now. What's the most important part about personas is empathy. When I say that is literally being able to feel like that person, right? Like mm -hmm. put on a mask, like, and, and, and not be yourself, right? That, which is a difficult thing to do, right? It requires way more emotional depth in the persona, mm -hmm. right? Um, and an understanding of their context. Um, not, not terribly difficult to achieve, right? Like we've, we've retrofitted personas, but they're meant to do something very different. And what we do is take them through processes. We have several exercises once we've got these personas in place where people have to speak in first person language. It's I, but it's not I, Jeffrey, it's I, Chris, okay? What, right? I am not the person I am. Um, you, you know, I am not um, kind of rambling and all over the place and freewheeling thought, right? Where, where You're Chris, the, the software engineer or right, the... Right, yeah. who, 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 who uh, tells you what he's going to say, told it to you, and then summarizes it, okay? Yeah. Um, so you, you go into, the, you know, and, and, and so you really have to go into this person, be this person, and the I statements have to come from Chris, right? Um, and we start thinking about what would kill the deal. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right? We call this exercise our pre-mortem. Everybody knows what a post-mortem is. Yes. That's a, right? But it's what would make this deal untenable for Chris? Like what would, you know, um, how about I get, I get tons of phone calls from this salesperson when they have nothing to offer me. I'll just shut them down. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, 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 you know, um, I get emails that seem overly personal that are obviously canned. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I've blocked you. I, I no longer, like, you go directly into spam. Right? So there are all sorts of ways that I can start to anticipate some of these things. Mm -hmm. Right? Because Chris is this guy who's highly introverted, um, no BS, doesn't want any extraneous type of thoughts. And he, it's not that he doesn't want a personal relationship, is that he doesn't think that because you spoke to him once on the phone, right, that you've created one. Yeah, yeah, totally. Right? Um, and so he doesn't think of the distance you put or the lack of distance as something that is appropriate. And so, and so we 
go on, we go on and on. And what we do is we develop these deal killers, right? Typically, you, there'll be way over 100 of them by the time we're done. Through all the wow. Okay. That's a pretty exhaustive list. And just, just so for anyone who's listening right now, just so that, you know, there's, I want to make sure everybody's following. This is, you're talking about the process that um, you and Brian have developed after years of evolving, like from CRO to persuasion architecture, understanding that you need personas and evolving that a few steps further. So you're organizing these fine behaviors into personas. You're still using that, but it's an, it's narrative driven. And right. It's right. Um, we, okay. we used to try and think because we were originally confined to web. We used to think of it as um, more of a, of a relevance, right? That if that, that, that in persuasion, persuasive momentum, um, you know, you know that we were looking like the look forward till found rule, right? If you keep, if you click, uh, right, move forward till found rule. If you click in and it doesn't mm, have what mm. you want or it doesn't contain a link to what you want, you'll move backwards. But we realize that that's kind of about life, right? E e you know, there's only so many times that you could say, you know, Jeffrey, what's your favorite food? And I say, you know, uh, the rain in Spain, and right, like they, they would be, say, be like, oh, this is a good conversation. Let's not have it, right? So it, we're always looking for relevance, right? That's the first key in persuasive momentum, right? Is it is is this something that has that, that got my attention? And then is it actually relevant? Was it just the word, right? Was it a, a clickbait type of thing, or is this really about what I'm thinking? Mm -hmm. And then, mm -hmm. do I know what to do next? Meaning, is it's it not just what I want to do. an intuitive right. next action. Do I want to take that action? Right. So, if 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 you gave me a headline that led mm -hmm. to an article, right, and I read and and, and it's starting to look right, um, and at the end of the article, you offered me. Um, links to a couple of other articles that are complementary, right? I have to ask, I still ask myself, is this what I want to do? Right? Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because it doesn't follow that I'm going to go there. It's still my choice. It takes a, a, um, a conscious choice, right? And so we think, when we think about um, persuasion architecture or how buyer legends work, what we're really doing is we're thinking almost like in a programming sense, step by step, about the states that our minds yes. go. Yes. In order to get somewhere. So we start with the end, right? The final state is this is what you know, I I I buy and I'm and I'm happy, right? Mm -hmm. But you as you work backwards, there are not unlimited things that you could have gone done before that. Right. If you work forward, then that's just fiction, right? So, yeah. So, and this is part of the whole idea of a, a what you do during the pre mortem. It's like there's a finite universe of actions that go in right. and decisions that go into the buying the buying right. process. We want to recognize which of those decisions might kill the deal for somebody. Now, here's the interesting part. Sometimes it's inevitable. That if you kill the deal for that, that, that what will make the deal for one will kill the deal for the other, right? Oh, so, okay. So this is good. This is good um, so because there's this that you can take them down different paths, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's not, and then you need to start making different decisions, right? Like there, there are possibilities that what's good for one customer may not be good for all of them. Yes. Okay. And so one of the ways that you come to that conclusion, I mean, so, I mean, like we do buyer personas, we don't call it, call them buyer personas because people just don't resonate with that. Um, and it's a different process, but I think something that I do know about your process, how you're, I don't know if you currently do it this way, but you use MBTI personality types. Do you still but do that? As, yeah, but, but not as people so um just okay. use mbti all the time okay mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. we're students of it um we've worked w with a consulting psychologist uh richard grant who's 
just brilliant at explaining it. And what he'll tell you is it's not a predictor. It's not an excuse, right? People wind up using them in HR exercises. And, you know, and then they start saying, well, I can't because of this. Well, first of all, um, Myers-Briggs measures nothing more than preferences. Mm, okay. What it's saying is you're more comfortable. So as That's normal, interesting. All right. my hands, I have a little silicon bowl here, right? Um, I could do this with my left hand and I can do it with my right. I'm right-handed, so I prefer to do everything with my right hand, right? But it doesn't mean I can't do it with my left. Sure. So the idea that, that we may prefer introversion to extroversion, right? It's a matter of degree. It's a matter of context. The way we're using MBTI is a little bit less as a predictor or, the, uh, or, or as anything else. It was a lens through which to see the world like the mm. human operating system, okay? MBTI is describing something observable. Whether you believe that the type, you, you know, that your type indicates why you'll behave a certain way, there's, there's good reason to be a little skeptical of that. But what it does is it describes a way of viewing normal human behavior, right? Mm -hmm. People are to be more um, focused on outside stimulus versus internal, right? Or people are going to be more big picture rather than sure. detail, you know, starting at yeah, the specific. Yeah. Right? People are going to be more um, relationship oriented rather than logic oriented, right? Or people are going to be uh, making choices um, where they get real pleasure out of, you know, out of closure, and mm -hmm. other ones who feel less pleasure because they feel like they've closed off a bunch of, a, a bunch of different avenues that they could have gone, right? That's the, that's what it's, it's more complex, but that's basically what Myers-Briggs is Sure, explaining. it's a model. You're saying yeah. it's predictive for buying behaviors. It doesn't translate. Um, uh, well, it's not predictive at all for human beings. Okay. Right? Uh, if you if I if you I gave you Myers Briggs type, I cannot predict what you can do, right? I may be able to communicate better with you mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I would understand what you what you prefer, right? Okay. Like you, we don't always do what we prefer, right? Like I prefer to have I, I, I'm a relationship driven person. I'm an F on that, right? So I am an INFP, okay. Um, but I can't make all my decisions that way. I wish I could. It would be really nice if I could only do business with people I really enjoy, and you, you know, and just like I could give you all sorts of things, and I'll and I'll wind up sounding sappy, okay? But it would be my preference. It's just not. Yeah. The yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. um, I could say I don't like closure, right? So I prefer to leave an engagement open ended, and then I wind up without any clients. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. So I know how to, right? It's just not my preference. I use I, I easily get taken off the path. Yeah. Right. But yeah. I have to keep them back on. So what we're really doing is describing that as the arena where humans play. And what we're looking to do whenever we limit things, right? Because it's funny because a Johari window can be done as a two by two grid and so can a Myers Briggs, right? It, it's we're trying, but when you try and limit things you make them a little bit easier to understand, right? All, there's lots of complexity here, and we're oversimplifying only to the point of trying to understand that human beings could act this way, right? Mm -hmm. so if you're selling commercial um, jet aircraft engines, okay? It doesn't really matter how emotional people are, right? Their decision isn't really made emotionally. Right. Okay. Because there's a lot of hard engineering and finance involved. However, right, if the first day that you met the salesperson, right, he came up and he smacked you in the head and he said, wake up, buddy. I got the goods. Right. Um, in a um, apples to apples comparison, I would bet you that that guy who smacked you in the head would lose the deal. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So 
Right. Now, it's not reliant on that. It's funny because because we actually, um, we didn't work on the deal because we finally decided that we couldn't invest the time in understanding it. But th we were we were asked to work on something with with jet aircraft engines because I gave that example all the time. And really, it's just too complex to, to want to get into. But there's a whole lot of whining and dining. And, and like, the relationships are critically important. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. But again, this is part of that buying scenario where we need to figure out to what degree, right? The relationships mm. work at the top, funny enough, at the top of the funnel. You don't get it passed if you don't have this, right? So you need to look at these things and understand what's possible and what's not, right? So that's all, that's all we're really doing is prescribing what isn't possible, mm -hmm. right? There'll never be an actual decision made about buying that in an emotional way, mm -hmm. right? But there's plenty of things that are, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, especially like products that are sold to human resources. Well, this is, right? that, yeah, that's interesting. Okay. Right? I, I, I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm trying to do something that, that sounds really cut and dry. Mm -hmm. But human resources products are often sold on, on how people feel and not whether or not it's profitable to the company. I mean, we've, we've worked now with, with two companies that have been selling into human resources and they misunderstand the motivations, right? It's not that budget doesn't matter. It's that they actually, like the, the, the people who are gonna bring this decision through the organization have other goals and their goals are, are about the human beings involved. Right, that doesn't. It, it it may not sound right to you if you're the guy who's building the tool makes it more efficient. But what they want to know is what the experience is like. Mm -hmm. Right. So again, that's a that's a very emotional decision. You have to know how to talk about those things and how far to involve them, stuff like that. So you you can set up your scenarios, right? Kind of your run books, right? In a way that sure, sense. yeah. That is so cool. I mean, I, I really, I, I think that's an amazing process. And I feel like I never would have thought about approaching it in that way. But it totally makes sense. Um, well, we're sometimes surprised that we thought of thinking it, of it in that way. I mean, you know, when, when we put this together, um, there were a lot of people involved, right? I, and I can't, uh, you know, none of us would claim all the credit. Um, and so it was a synthesis of how to think about human beings and how, why they do what they do. And a whole lot of people came together with us um, that added little pieces that said, oh, well, this, this, this particular thing helps us. Like that, that pre-mortem, um, I think we allude to it in um, Waiting for the Cat to Bark. But at that time, it was just something we were starting to do. We were experimenting with. Mm, mm, interesting. Okay. Um, I, I want to keep going, but we're like at time right now. So I, let's like wrap this idea up because I think it's really interesting and we, we might just have to do another interview. But um, I mean, so you, you kind of got outside of the bottle to design this process yes. is what it sounds like. Yeah. Um, that's really, really cool. So, I mean, just, I, I just, let's tie up this idea though about the whole process. I think it's really valuable and interesting to people who might be watching or familiar with buyer personas and, um, and ways to work with cognitive bias, you know, and being more aware of that. Um, so from the pre-mortem to kind of what, like, what's the, with the end product, what's that narrative driven end product? Um, so the narrative driven end product is, um, and I said, we do that reverse chronology. I didn't name it, but you know, we, we, we design with the end state in mind. And what we're doing is creating, um, scenarios that we'd like to take our buyers through. Okay. And in all of them, there's the reasoning of why they want to do it. So the final product is a story. Okay. Um, that conveys, details in a way that's more interesting, right? In a way that you might work with them. Um, but also talks about the customer's motivations to go through stuff. So we're really giving them what the customer would have as a 
you, you know, I, I use ideal and you can put it between quotation marks, right? Uh, because, right, it's, it's the, the, the best scenario the customer could expect okay. is what we're writing, okay. right? And then, yeah, you, you know, we're, we're counting on, co on companies to look at that, right, and go back and say, oh, well, all these things that could have killed the deal. Well, this is kind of universal. This is not. And then everybody kind of knows they're on the same page, right? You're, you're not just, it's not just the product people or just the marketing people or just the sales people. Everybody sees that these, that everything that's happening is way more interrelated. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And that the, um, that the experience the client has, right, is determined by the weakest link. Mm -hmm. Right. I love it. But, yeah. So. I, I mean, it's, it's a narrative that's not just about who the buyer is and what their day to day is. This is a narrative about the entire buying process. Yeah. If, if, if and, you're writing about the customer, it's, it has a purpose. It has a use. It is the very first step. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, I spoke with Adele a while back and we just, we couldn't reach timing stuff and whatnot about helping people go through scenarios, right? Literally taking them through and, and, and helping them understand the context of those personas interacting. Um, and, and, um, it's the, the necessary next step for anybody who has personas right now. Is to create the buyer legend, essentially, to create yeah. that, yeah. Look, I mean, you, you know, in the UX world, there's tons of people who talk about this. Um, I, I, I think I saw a tweet by Kim Godden just the other day that said that um, personas without scenarios are worthless. And, and I actually completely agree. If you have personas, and you haven't thought through scenarios, um, then what you've mainly done um, is corporate masturbation. I love it. Yeah. There's a lot of that going on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, they're meant to be applied. And I, this, this process, I, I think like... It's right, it should, it should inform your tests, it should inform your copy, it should, everything that you do right, should be informed by how you, you think it's going to feel to your customer, right? That's the, 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 the qualitative part. And then make, make sure you're right, right? Like you want to be confirming, how would I know that this is working is not the right question. How do I know that I got the right, that, that this is the factor that's important, right? I, I, I love it when I'm going to bring you back to a very simple CRO example, okay? The, the famous button test. What performs better, a green or a red, okay? Mm -hmm. So we do the test. And by the way, the thing that performs better will likely be the thing with more contrast. So green or red depends on the rest of your background, right? Because you're, you're trying to call attention. Anyway, beyond that. At the end of the day, the question of green or red the context of it is, oh, I realized what it was that you, you were offering me and I saw it right away. Great. But even if you got a lift, right, it's kind of an empty win. It's not that it's not worth doing. It's that you understand nothing more about your client, right? Like, are you, you could test all sorts of shades and you, can, and, and you can be surprised, right? Sometimes something that sharply contrast isn't as good as something that mildly whatever it's just okay. data but, points but with the things that are important to the customer right if you change those like um right now we're doing some testing with a client and it's price testing okay, okay. Um, and contrary to the to their belief we are disproving something they have a uh, think of it as a good a, a, a good, better, best. Sure. And that is high setting, right? They're convinced that they're, that they need the good option in order to contrast. Mm. I would tend to agree in theory, 
okay? Um, it makes sense to have a, a comparison point, right? If you get this, you get that, you know, we can all think of um, um, Dan Ariely doing, a, 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 doing his example with The Economist, right? Where you could buy the subscription either online and off, all that, right? Like there's a whole bunch of examples about pricing. And so they did what, what is a standard best practice. Um, and in work, working through the persona work, we came up with a hypothesis, okay? The hypothesis said that that difference that they're pointing to is undetect, undetectable to most customers. It's not something they really cared about. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so we've been running a test where some people are exposed only to um, two choices instead of three, okay? And we are coming out with no difference. Now, what does that teach us? It only, say, it only brings up the question of whether what they think is true is true. I don't believe it teaches us anything yet. I think, and we'll, we'll reach statistical validity any day, or we may have a ready, because I don't have a client meeting next week, right? But um, I think that what it shows us is that the assumption that it mattered needs to be tested. Yeah. yeah. Okay? Because it wasn't changing the price. We simply eliminated that tier and said this or that, and we're still not getting any difference. There's no, this, there was no significant difference in the amount of people who were buying. There was no amount of difference in people who are picking one or the other, right? Except that um, as long as you group the middle with the lower end. Oh, interesting. Okay. But then it doesn't tell you. It doesn't tell you. When, when you did the analysis, so uh -huh. far, okay, it seems that some of the people at the lower end do wind up in that middle end. Okay? Okay. Mm. Not big enough. To, the yeah. problem the, the thing that we saw is that that big differentiator is something that people don't understand the benefit of. I think that, because we're already thinking through a several more experiments, right? But I think what's going to come out of this is that people are not buying what they think they're buying. Mind you, this, this, this company is doing 11 million in sales right now. Okay, so they're not a tiny little company and they sell... In, in a software world, that's a pretty good sized company, mm -hmm. right? And they actually, what, what, we, what we're intending to get at is people don't understand this, this feature as a real benefit. And it's expensive right. to provide. That's a funny thing is, right? There's, right. A, it's a, person, it, there's a, a service component in that. And people are not even understanding it very well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Uh, that, great example. Um, so, I mean it's that context what's happening on behind there's like this binary response but you know why is that and that understanding that you know is it this feature or it could be anything like that i mean that's especially if it's expensive to provide that's a huge area you know some, to, some people just don't value it they don't yep. first of all they don't know that they're going to need it mm -hmm. One of the things that we found, I, I, again, it's to give you a little bit more color, right? Some of them don't know that they need it because they haven't tried it yet. Therefore, they don't know that they're going to need it, okay? Um, and, you know, like in, in the ideal world, people would come in either at the top or the bottom and then scale down or scale up their service. Yeah. Right. Like once people start, you should, it, it sounds counterintuitive, but you would offer them the option of, hey, you're not using this at all. If you're aware of it and you're not using it, why don't we lower your, your price? Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or you require a lot of this service, right? Um, we can't continue to do that at this price. Sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But that would break the way everybody sells. But maybe that needs to happen. <laughs> you know, I mean, people, yeah, yeah. I, I but, think but it is breaking it apart, right? Like mm -hmm. you'd have to have to create a service package that you either added or deducted, or right. So, but again, it, it becomes a product issue. The, 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 the team was so convinced that it was the marketing issue. Um. Yeah, the, 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 a merchandising issue. Sure. Okay. 
Right. But I mean, that, and that's the, that's the amazing thing. When you dig into this and you go through, whether it's buyer personas or user testing or whatever it is, you know, but do it in a way that I guess balances the qualitative and quantitative, you can start to uncover this stuff. Yeah. Um, and, and recognize that there's more you don't know than you know. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's a great quote. That, yeah, that, I think that's a great so much stupider than I think, right? Like, I am wrong so much more than I would like to be. Mm -hmm. okay? And once you accept that, and you accept the fact that if you're in a group, and the whole group agrees, they're even more likely to be wrong. This is right? great. Okay, so I mean, we need to wrap up here because I know you have to, you have something else after this, but um, let's like just final piece of advice or insight for someone going through this. I like this group mentality scenario that you've, you have going right now. Um. Don't assume that everybody is you. This, it's an empathy thing. Put yourself in another mindset. Um, con convince yourself that very few people buy like you or know what you know or feel how you do. And then figure out what makes other people tick. I love it. Jeffrey, thank you so much for coming on again to talk about cognitive bias. And I'm really excited that we had a chance to do it in a way that is totally relevant to what's going on in B2B today. Um, so anyone who's watching, thank you for making it this far. If you liked this video, be sure to subscribe for weekly videos like this. For more information, visit customerintelligenceinstitute.com. Be sure to check out Jeffrey's uh, other interview as well, which again is linked below, and we'll see you on the next episode of Insight and Insight. And Brian's as well, both linked. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me on. Thanks, Jeffrey.